Hello, I'm Carl Eulen Halverson, and you are watching Living Green on a Blue Planet. Today we're going to continue following Carrie Vrabel as she leads members of the community in her uh, wild foraging hikes. They're educational, they build camaraderie, they're relaxing, and it's just a good excuse to be out in nature if you need an excuse to be out in nature. Uh, we're going to watch Carrie in uh, different seasons and different sites. And so we'll see her when it's kind of windy and a little cool. We'll see her in a, a sunny, sunny setting. Uh, but we'll also end with her uh, in slides, uh, teaching and hiking in the fall and the winter, and you'll see the snow on the ground. We're also going to see her in a number of settings. So the first setting is Eagle Marsh. And Eagle Marsh had been part of the uh, swamp, the black swamp, and then was drained and became a cornfield, but wasn't real productive because it kept flooding. And then uh, was re recently restored to an 800 plus uh, wetland. And if you've been to Eagle Marsh and you've done the trails, then you know that it has lots of different personalities and uh, ecosystems. And so there's the berm, which is this barrier, because it's a continental divide uh, that, um, separates the, the watershed that goes to the Wabash and the Mississippi from the watershed that goes to the Great Lakes, Lake Erie. And that berm's really important because it's a barrier so that invasive Asian carp that are already in the Mississippi River area though do not get into the Great Lakes and be a, a economic threat, an ecological threat uh, to the fisheries. And so there's that, but there's also uh, multiple wetlands. There's uh, wet forests, but there's also forested areas. Uh, and Carrie's going to be hiking in an area that's prairie. So if you look at the field where she's at, uh, imagine that months later, because when he comes to September, uh, the very plants she's looking at become tall. And it's a field of pink and yellow and purple flowers that just kind of wave in the wind. It's really beautiful. She's here when the, when the plants are much smaller and younger, which is good because that means that most of them are more edible. Okay. Um, so we're going to watch her there. This is a, one of her larger classes, and she'll show us uh, the abundance of food that, that are in these fields. Uh, and she'll talk about which ones are invasive and which ones are native, and which ones are edible, which ones are medicinal, and which ones are toxic. Uh, the next setting will be at Channel Lake State Park, and we'll be walking alongside one of the, the lakes. And some of the plants are different, but the process of identification and being cautious and knowing what parts of the plant can be used and which ones cannot, uh, it's the same process. And, uh, and it's also just a, a wonderful day. And so <clears throat> from there, we, we switch gears excuse me, and go to a slideshow of her uh, leading a group or groups in Fox Island. This is before the derecho, before the storm that knocked over 2,000 trees. And so it's still this pristine preserve. And um, it has dunes and wetlands and, and woods and prairie. And uh, she'll be walking there uh, and identifying plants in the fall uh, when the pickings are a little thinner but also in the winter when it really requires her um, master identification skills and knowing what's available to either be eaten or, or uh, can be drank. And so um, you'll see that uh, her, her um, students are always engaged. They're always enjoying it. Some are taking notes as they're hiking, uh, but many are just enjoying you know the the smells of the plants and the and the sounds of the animals and the breezes and just being part of nature so um we're going to continue watching her i hope you enjoy it and see you on the other side bye pour that mixture into some ice cube trays and then you have a wonderful like poison ivy cure so you can just take an ice cube out and rub it on your skin and it's it's great um, the other thing that's really fun about these is that when they go to seed they have those magical popping seeds they also are called uh, touch me knots um, 
and when you touch them, they just like explode everywhere. When they jump, and, you know, I had a woman like scream at the top of her lungs when I <laughs> showed her how to do that. It was hilarious. Um, you can actually eat those little seeds that pop out of there. They taste kind of like a walnut. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. They're not practical to to collect in any kind of quantity, but um, they are edible and they're fun just as a novelty to eat them. <laughs> um, aside from that, um, when you see this plant, if you notice the stem, it's kind of translucent. It reminds me of a straw, like a light green straw that's filled with water. And what's cool about jewelweed is that it actually doesn't produce very much cellulose. Um, it, it relies on water pressure. That's why it loves wet areas. It relies on water pressure in order to stay upright. So it's really kind of a stem that's full of, like it is like a straw full of water. It's really sweet. Um, so that is jewelweed and that is a rose mallow. Um, I think those are the main two I wanted to talk about here. Are there any questions on those two so far? All right. I'll make sure everybody's over here. So this wonderful plant is called wild bergamot or bee balm. Some people call it the pizza plant, um, and you'll know why in a second. So um, there are a couple little patches I'll help you down here. Um, this is in the mint family. This is one of our natives also. It's often in like wildflower mixes when you do like native wildflowers that you plant. They have these beautiful um, lavender flowers with these long sort of tubular petals that you might have seen them in like a field or something. The whole plant tastes like oregano, kind of like a wild oregano, um, but I think better personally. So typically um, this is used and is used by the Native Americans. It was dried and used as a seasoning. So the same way you'd use oregano. You could also cook with the fresh herb and um, there's really cool ethnobotany about the Native Americans eating this raw, eating a couple leaves while singing and dancing because it's such a strong flavor. You know, mostly herbs, you don't really eat them fresh. Typically you dry them and use them sparingly. Um, so when you eat this, if you're interested, this is the one part of the park that's not, hasn't been super sprayed. So you're, this is safe to taste a leaf if you're not shy about strong flavors. Um, it can almost make your tongue a little bit numb but in a really cool way. I think it gives me energy. <laughs> um, but you also, and you'll get that flavor. At the very least, I encourage you to find a leaf and smell it. If you don't want to taste it, that's fine, but just tear it and smell it, rub it between your fingers, and um, you'll get the sense of that wonderful sort of oregano flavor. Um, the other thing to keep in mind when you see this plant is that it is in the mint family, and I'm gonna talk about another mint as we go back on our walk. And mints have a square stem, so Take notice of the stem. It's really cool that it's square, like you wouldn't expect that. And then it has opposite leaves. So the leaves grow across from each other, like two shoulders. Um, and those are both, uh, and it also has, is fragrant. And all three of those tend to be qualities of a mint. And if you're interested in learning more about, you know, plant ID is like the first skill to master if you want to become a forager. And so knowing your, your plant families and knowing those attributes is really helpful. So there's a book called Botany in a Day for people who are really interested in like learning the attributes of those families. Um, but it's just cool to know that when you look at this, you're like, okay, square stem, opposite leaf, smells good. I may not know exactly what it is, but I, I think it's in the mint family. That's a really cool first step toward getting a positive ID. This is butterweed. This is not an edible. This is an, a native, beautiful flower. It's, it's everywhere right now. I want to point it out because it's a look-alike to a lot of our mustards, um, except that the flower is very different, and I'll, t I'll explain it in a little bit, but I just want to introduce you as you're looking at this and we're walking. This is butterweed. It's a native, non-edible, toxic plant to humans. You got it? I don't want you to get hit. It's huge. It gets super tall, and the leaves, um, they're perfoliate, is the way you, is how you uh, say it scientifically. But so the it, the stem goes through the leaf, and the leaf goes all the way across, and hold it can hold water. It makes like a little boat, kind of, so which is really cool because first of all, a lot of animals. So in a prairie, you know, you are you, don't, you want water, right? You want access to water in a prairie because it could get hot and dry. So these plants are important for wildlife because they hold water. A lot of times you'll see little frogs like sitting next to the water on a leaf, which is so sweet. Um, and there are accounts of Native Americans in times of water, when they needed water and they were traveling, that they would 
take like a straw of some sort and, and drink the water from the cup that the cup plant was holding. Um, you can't see those leaves. They're, they're just starting to develop the, that little boat shape. So right now it just looks like they have opposite leaves. Um, but as it gets older and taller, you'll see this really pronounced, beautiful little cup that it makes. Um, now cup plant, it's getting a little big now when it's about a foot tall, so a little bit shorter than this, it's edible, the shoot is edible. Usually we peel it first and you can eat it either raw or cooked. Um, but again, you know, you'd only do that in a situation where you weren't trying to, you know, this is a, this is a preserve and they're trying to conserve these native plants. But if you were out in a wild prairie and there was tons of this stuff, then that would be a good vegetable for you to be able to eat. So you can eat the young shoots um, peeled or and cooked or raw, um, the cup plant. Um, and also it makes a really pretty flower. It looks kind of like a sunflower, like a little miniature sunflower at the top. Um, so that's cup plant. Um, do you remember the bee balm? This is that beautiful bee balm we tasted, the wild oregano right here. That's, that's good. That's often in a, you find that in prairies. It likes a lot of sun. Um, the other plant is right here. This is a compass plant. Do you see these pretty flower, or this pretty leaf that's real kind of lacy? This is a compass plant. It also gets enormous. It's beautiful. It's very striking. Um, it's really tall. And um, the cool thing, so first of all, you can eat the young shoots of compass plant just like you would eat cup plant. So you, when they're smaller than a foot, and you would peel them, and usually you cook them. Some people eat them raw. But what's really cool about compass plant is that when it gets really tall and it has its main stem, if you break or injure the stem, it secretes this resin, and you can, Native Americans use it as like a wild chewing gum, which is really cool. Like inside, like, it like, like it's kind of like a sap, like it, it moves <laughs> out. Break apart. You, or you cut it, I mean, anything, you know, you don't want to kill a plant if you don't have right, to kill a plant, right? So, um, but yeah, when it, it exudes a resin when it's cut, basically. Yeah, um, so that's a really cool thing. Also, compass plant's really cool when it grows because it'll change, it'll change to face the sun, you know? So the leaves will move kind of side and be like flat, look kind of flat, which is really striking also. Um, so that's cup plant, and then we have the bee balm we talked about earlier, and then we have compass plant. And then the other prairie plant I want to point out it's edible is prairie dock. Um, oh, I will also tell you real quickly, some, pe some Native Americans did eat the leaves of cup plant when it was young, but they cooked it first because it's very, it can be super, super bitter. Most people don't do that anymore. It's sort of known as the shoot is what's known as being edible, but the plant, the, the leaves on cup plant, um, Historically, they have been cooked, probably cooked in a couple of change of wa changes of water is my guess, um, but they are technically edible. I just want to mention that. Um, so this beautiful, huge leaf, this is a prairie dock, a prairie dock, and um, it really, it's not considered a major edible food, but when it, pre it's going to, next to it, it's going to pop up a flowering shoot next to these big, beautiful leaves. Is it going to be a flowering shoot? And that flowering shoot before it flowers is edible, um, peeled and cooked also. So we have cup plant, compass plant, and prairie dock that have these sort of vegetable shoot, uh, when they're little babies, you can eat them as shoot vegetables. Um, but then they're gonna get really big and beautiful. So um, there are so many other beautiful plants to eat. We probably This is probably not on the top of my list, but if, I, if the zombies were after me, <laughs> you guys can stick with me. We have, look at all this food we would have. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you see the plant that I'm talking about. I know it's a big group, but I'm sorry. But um, it's also kind of awesome that it's a big group, so we get both sides of it. But, um, so this guy right here, I'll hold up a piece of it. Okay. This is Field Pennycrest gone to seed. So this is a non-native, right? So this is um, this is one that pops up, probably left over from when this was a cornfield. <laughs> um, this loves corn, these little field pennycrest loves cornfield. Um, we're going to see several mustards today. Um, most of, we seem to have a lot of mustards, non-native mustards um, that grow in our landscape. Um, the nice thing is that they're all edible. Um, they're, they're just not native, so when people are trying to make just a native area, then they can be frustrated by them, but um, I love them. They they're, make me happy. Um, so field pennycress, and I think I'll show you some in flower. See these white flowers? These pretty white flowers? Before it goes to seed, it flowers. And it has four petals, 
and they make like a cross shape and that's a feature so remember I talked about mints they have a square stem and opposite leaves and usually are fragrant uh, mustards have uh, four leaves that have four petaled flowers that are like x-shaped or cross-shaped and they can be all different colors um, usually they're white or yellow but they're also some really cool like purple ones that we're gonna see up here um, so penny crest the entire above ground tender part, uh, parts of the plant are edible. So when it's young, you can eat the leaves and the flowers. Um, they tend to be pretty strong tasting, like spicy. This is a spicy one. So usually people either cook the crap out of them or um, they'll use like the, the shoot or the stem and it tends to be a little milder, um, but you can play with it. It's all non-toxic. It's really what to your taste. Um, but the cool thing about these seed pods, the way they are now, is that they can be used as a seasoning. So some people will toss them into a salad, um, just to give it a little like, whoo, a little zing. Um, or you can dry them and use them as a seasoning that way. Um, some people even try to extract the seeds from once these mature and actually fully go to seed. They'll try to extract the seeds and make like their own homemade mustard with some of our wild mustards. So, um, I want to show you some goldenrod we have goldenrod growing here and what's nice about where it's growing here is that it's growing near it can also be mistaken for some species of sunflower um, which is here and this is gives you a good idea of how good you need to be at ID when you're thinking about foraging so these two oh, sorry these two leaves are from two very different plants. Do you see how similar those are? So the one on the left is goldenrod. Goldenrod has these long parallel veins that run um, all the way from the base to the tip. Can you guys see these? I know it's really close, but you're looking for, you see the middle <laughs> vein and then you see two long veins that run almost parallel to it, all the way to the tip. Goldenrod is a wonderful, um, you can eat the shoots when they're about this young, although we usually peel them because they can be pretty bitter, um, kind of strong tasting. But you can peel and cook the shoots at this age. Um, but it's most famous for being used as a tea. The Native Americans used it as tea. Um, they actually introduced the colonists when um, in the Liberty tea mixes, when the colonists decided to dump the British tea and find alternatives, they would use bee balm, which we talked about earlier. And then goldenrod was also in that mix. So it has a lot of history of that. Um, all of our goldenrods that grow here are safe to use. Some of them taste better than others. Um, so they can be difficult to distinguish between the species. And they're native and beautiful. Um, and when you're not sure of an ID, especially before the plant has gone to flower, you uh, before you would ever, ever eat it, unless somebody's with you who knows what it is, you want to wait until it goes to flower. Because once these flower, there's going to be no mistaking the goldenrod, which has teeny, teeny, tiny yellow flowers all over it, and then the sunflower, which is going to look like sun, like a small sunflower. So when I was just at a little bit out of college, I did a year-long apprenticeship with a woman um, in Illinois who's just like knows everything about wild edible plants. We studied 230 species of wild edible plants, and we did it year-round. And I mean, we looked at them every season. We studied how the leaves change. You know, you just get to, we got to really, it's, it's taken me probably 25 years to be able to ID some of these things, you know? So just want to give you an idea of, of that process and, and, a, and sort of a glimpse into my world. <laughs> okay, so these beautiful flowers, um, we've done a walk where we ate this, the greens of these, remember? This, this is yeah, Dame's Rocket. Yeah, that doesn't so yeah. So I love Dame's Rocket. Dame's Rocket is actually a mustard. It's in the mustard family. And it has, you can tell, um, mustards have these four petaled flowers in the shape of like a cross or an X. And um, Dame's Rocket is non native. It was brought over as an ornamental plant. It was Marie Antoinette's favorite flower. Apparently, she would have a bouquet brought to her every day. And um, Monet, the painter, um, planted these at the Bernie, and so they're probably like in his paintings, but we can't really tell what flowers are what in those paintings. Um, anyway, so I eat, before the uh, flowers pop, I eat the basil leaves. Like these are too old now, they'd be super, super bitter. But these are the, what the basil leaves look like, and they have these really funny teeth on the sides, and they're really furry. But when they're, when they're young, they're 
they're not as furry and they're got they're nice they're tender they have a little bit of a spice to them because they're a mustard um but what when these are excellent is when they're sauteed like spinach that's so like mm. choice but only young <laughs> Young, yeah. I eat the leaves when they're young. I mean, if I were starving, I would right. cook this and but eat it too. How big are they? When they're like the size, oh. the leaves. But but it's a so they start out in a basil rosette, like mm -hmm. uh, along the ground, like a dandelion, you know. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you eat them before it shoots up its flower stalk. Okay. Yeah. Um, but right now we can eat flowers, oh. and they're nice. Oh. They're kind of um, you can just grab one or two, just eat the whole thing. Um, they're kind of sweet. They kind of have a little bite to them. Um, they're like I said, they're in the mustard family, but they're nice. Just the petals or the full flower? The yep, crunch it down. Thank you. So yeah, people toss these in salads because it's got that spice to them, you know. She will eat it. Yes, eat the other side. Also, black raspberries fruit about three weeks before blackberries. So we'll see some blackberries back there. They're actually just in flower right now, so they're not they're not close to fruit. But these are gonna that's gonna be a nice patch right yeah, there's there. There's a bunch right behind you too. Yeah, oh. yeah, it's a really nice accessible. They spread patch. quick. of little tuber, like little, um, say they're maybe the size of a dime, maybe a little bigger. Um, and you can dig up a whole bunch of them when you see a dent. This isn't a super dense colony. Um, but that was a, it, it, traditionally it's been called hog peanut, but that's looked at as a sort of derogatory term. Um, it was, the Native Americans would dig these and eat them, and the settlers would came and saw that um, the pigs also, you know, pigs are really good at finding roots and eating them, so they're really nice little edible tubers. Um, so they call them hog peanut, and um, so it's just kind of thought of in a negative way. But um, anyway, that's, it's really good when you have a huge colony of them. You can dig, they're not very far, maybe like two inches below the ground, and you can get a lot of them, and you can, um, if you can harvest enough, put them in a soup or, you know, that way. But that's a good, good little root. So if you were quickly glancing at this, you might think it was an ash sapling. Um, but then when you notice the thorns, mm -hmm. that gives it away. It's a prickly ash. And these little berries are going to mature and end up, um, they're used kind of like the outer husk. So the inside berry you don't usually eat. You eat the outer husk of the berry and it's used like a Szechuan corn pepper or peppercorn. Szechuan peppercorn kind of vibe. Like it's a really strong peppery, definitely used as tiny amounts as a seasoning, but it's nice to know that there's an edible property to prickly ash. So, and there's a bunch of wood metal under there too that we already saw. Mm. So this is all multiflora. And then this is an elderberry starting to flower back there if you see the flower clusters at the top. And again, elderberry has opposite compound leaves. See how they're opposite each other? compound leaves so a lot of times people confuse these with dogwood because dogwood's in flower right now dogwood has opposite leaves but they're not compound so that's the way you can tell the difference so this is a nice elderberry so these are gonna have the black little berries on them. yeah Ooh. like there's some first they're in flower and you can actually eat the flowers I do like a fritter
about wood nettle, right? Yeah. Remember wood nettle had the big egg-shaped leaves? This is stinging nettle. Ooh. It's a lot less stingy. It has opposite leaves. You can kind of see the hairs. It still stings, it still hurts. I always get stung. When I was a kid, I ran through a field of these with my shorts. Oh gosh. That's how I learned about stinging nettle. Um, anyway, stinging nettle is extremely nutritious. It's like a superfood for foragers, oh. um, along with dandelion greens. It's a really, it's high in minerals. It's high in vitamin A and C. Um, I have friend, forager friends who actually dry the leaves and they make it into a powder and use the powder, throw it in everything like oatmeal Protein or shape. rice and use it as like a nutritional supplement because that's how powerful it is. Um, so cooking it or steaming it or drying it or crushing it, like you could use it fresh in a pesto, any of those activities will kill the sting. So it has these really fragile little hairs that are that um, have a little chemical in them, but they're really easy to break down. Like it doesn't take much. So you can pick them up with gloves and then yes. bag them and then. Nope. So I have actually made you guys a stinging nettle tea Aww. so that you can taste it because I love how it tastes. And I think of it as like a mild, sweeter, slightly sweeter version of green tea, but it walks the line between sweet and savory, which is great because a lot of people will use nettle broth, like they'll boil the leaves and then they'll drink the broth as tea because then you've got double whammy. You've got the nutritious greens and then you've got a nutritious tea. Um, the tea, if you add any sodium to it, it makes a wonderful broth, like really good broth. Um, if you added lemon and maybe like a little yeah. sugar or something, it's, it can be sweet also. So it's like the walks the line. So when you drink it, be prepared. It's not like gonna be sweet. Um, I think it has almost a, like an asparagus kind of flavor to it. Which